Are you going there this evening? together. Amen. And the environment we live in, it's good to be here together. And let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of James. 
As we begin in this verse this evening, thank God for the privilege to be here. And may he be glorified in all we do. James chapter 1. We'll start in the book of James chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading from verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Praise the Lord. So count it all joy. That's the challenge. Amen. That's the challenge. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified today, that you would be high and lifted up, Lord, in everything we would say and do. May you have preeminence, Lord, and take control of these lips, Lord, to speak your words. And God, I pray that you would mold our hearts, Lord, into your character, that you would change us, Lord, into your likeness, that you would lift us up word by word. We love you, and we ask that, Lord, that you would take control of this service now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have your seats. So, um, just want to give you a quick update. I did. I was able to talk to the health department in Allen County, and it didn't change anything. So I was hopeful, but it didn't really matter much. I implored. I asked questions. I ran scenarios, and basically nothing's changed. We have to wear the mask, even if we're seated, even if we're six feet apart from one another. We still have to wear the mask in the service. Sunday school, kids under 10 don't have to wear the mask, but teachers do. And uh, the only time that the teacher is supposed to remove their mask in Sunday school is if they're having trouble communicating. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not interpreting that in any way, but, but anyhow, that's what I was told. And then uh, also there, there is an exemption for the hearing impaired. Whenever you're speaking to someone who's hearing impaired, you can remove your mask. So please, if anybody's talking to Brother Wesley, always take your mask off because he, read, he reads lips. <laughs> hey, amen. Brother, you're going to get a lot of fellowship in church. <laughs> amen. So praise the Lord. If we're stuck in this situation, we might as well enjoy it. Amen. Why be unhappy? I mean, God is good. Uh, Also, many of you might have heard that uh, Mike DeWine announced today that starting tomorrow at 6 p.m., it's a statewide mask mandate. So no shopping in Wapak, you know. It doesn't change anything now. We're all in the same boat together, which means the likelihood of a quick turnaround for Allen County is now gone because now Allen County is with the whole state. So as Columbus rises and falls, so do we which means God is really desiring to test his children. I'm convinced. He's tailor-made this one for us. But God be praised. We're going to be obedient. We're going to love him anyhow. We're going to praise the Lord anyway. Man, let's let's look together at 1 Peter. If we could turn over there quickly. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the scripture is consistent that these temptations and trials are good for us. They're working a wonderful thing in our life. We wouldn't ask for them. We don't necessarily... uh, um, in our human self, want them to come along, but God has designed it for our good, and it's working something beneficial to us that we need. So we say, praise the Lord. In good times, praise the Lord. In bad times, praise the Lord. In all times, praise the Lord. And I titled this today, just so we can keep our thought together, The Danger of Having It Too Good. (laughs) Self-explanatory title. The Danger of Having It Too Good. I'm going to read from this quote in the United Time and Sign from 1963. Brother Bram says, speaking of tension, I was praying about it this morning. What would you do if you didn't have tension? Just think of it. Tension is part of living. That kind of encouraged me when I thought that. If you had no tension, you'd be like a rag doll. You wouldn't have no feelings. There'd be nothing you could work on. Like a husband and wife, maybe if she wants to do something and they're trying to work together, especially Christians, 
and the other one wants, and, and when, when you come together, you find out what she's done. She finds out, see, the tension really brings you closer together. And somebody tells you that, well, said, just think of that little wife that went under a lot of tension when you wasn't so good, or the husband went under, tension, under some tension when you wasn't so good. Then when it's all forgiven, look how you feel about him. My, uh, you, you just see, you just got to have tension, that's all. And just think, if feelings, what if you didn't have any feelings, no pains or nothing? What if there'd be no pain at all? You'd have no feelings at all, see? And if you had no feeling, then one of your senses would be gone, see? So, see, everything's just right anyhow. So, God just give us grace to stand up to it. That's the thing. If I just stand up with that grace and stand there and say, we know that when this life is over, the great one's on the other side where we're looking to go to. And now we remember that all these things, that's a tension that, some people try to introduce Christianity that you're free from worry. You're not. No, you're not. He said, you're free from tension. Oh, no, you add tension when you become a Christian because you was kind of a slop, go, happy, go, lucky, whatever it was out there, not caring what you did. But when you become a real Christian, every moment you're wondering, am I pleasing my Lord? If I could hear from him, it puts you on tension, puts you on guard. That's what makes you what you are. So after all, tension is a blessing. So God creates situations that create more tension because it's a blessing. Tension is a blessing. It's just the way you're looking at it. It's just the way you're looking at it, see? If you just look the other side, no matter how thin you slice anything, you still got two sides to it, you see? So you want to see both sides. So tension, I think, oh my. What's this tension? If I could have been born without this tension, well, if I, would have had, if I wouldn't have had this tension, I wouldn't have been what I am. I wouldn't have been a Christian, perhaps. It was this tension that drove me to Jesus Christ, see? It's been a blessed, it's been a blessing thing in my life. Amen. This is the prophet who suffered from nervous tension for much of his life, and he really, really suffered. And he was saying uh, here, in 1963 that he's saying, this tension is a blessing in my life. It's the thing that drove me to Jesus Christ. It's the thing that creates desperation in life. Amen. Uh, God, God loves us so much that he doesn't, I would say it this way, God doesn't spoil his children. You know, I've seen spoiled children, and many of you have, and, and spoiled children always hate their parents. They're always fussing and fighting with their parents. They're never happy. They're never satisfied. They never have joy. Amen. Any joy that they have because a parent gives in to them is only temporary and it turns into frustration very quickly. Amen. And, and spoiled children are never satisfied. They're never happy and they're never at peace with mom and dad. Amen. But children who have been brought up difficult and rough and, and sparingly and not been spoiled, they love mom and dad. They're happy. They're content. I mean, they can be happy with a stick. I mean, they can play games with a bottle cap. I mean, they, be, they can become joyful. They become happy. And so God will not spoil his children because God wants to maintain the right relationship with us. If you look at what's happening in the government now, there's been such a, a, a spoiling of the American citizen by the U.S. government, trying to provide everything. In fact, you know, when this thing first came down, they want to give everybody extra money. Everybody gets a check for nothing. You did nothing, but you get a check. They want to give out another round of checks, amen? And the people that they're sending checks to are the people that's trying to uh, topple over monuments and spray paint state houses and... Why? Because spoiled children hate their parents and are never happy. Can you imagine the original Americans looking at what's going on now? They would be dumbfounded, amen? The, the, the Americans nowadays have more than they ever had back then, but the one thing they're lacking is character. They have money, they have jobs, they have cars, houses, stimulus checks, but no character. And, with, and, and, and Power without character is satanic. So God's going to make sure that his bride's going to have character because he's given his bride the word, and the unfolding of the word brings power. The revelation brings power, and God is not going to give her the power of his word, amen, until she's got the character to handle it. So God's going to make sure we go under tension. We're not going to be spoiled children. 
He's not going to give and give and give so we can turn around and shake our fist in his face and say we want more. But God is going to make sure that we have enough trials, enough troubles, enough difficulties, enough failures, enough tension so that every portion we get we're grateful for. Every new morsel that comes, every meal we say thank you. Amen. How many children sit down at breakfast, lunch, and supper, three meals a day that mom fixed and put on the table, and how many still say, thank you, mom? Thank you for lunch. Thank you for supper. It becomes so routine, we forget. Amen. And we can do the same thing with God. It becomes so routine, so expected that we begin to forget, amen, how precious it is for God to give revelation, how beautiful it is for God to give his word. What a wonderful thing it is, amen, to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. So God makes sure that we learn the lesson the right way. And at the end of the day, we're thankful. When we look back on a life that's had troubles, it's not been smooth all the way. There's been difficulties, there's been losses, there's been rejections, there's been separations, there's been highs and there's been lows. And, but you look back and you needed God and God brought you through this and he brought you through that and he brought, and all it does is build a greater gratitude and love in your heart for God. If it had been smooth all the way through and no trouble and, and no pressures and no difficulties, no disappointments, no tears, no anguish, amen, we wouldn't have the same level of gratitude. And so when these things come like they're coming now and like will be coming in the future, amen, these things are good for us. Let's turn to the book of Isaiah. Remember, we're looking at the danger of having it too good. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which is weak in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Let's turn from here over to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. Ezekiel 28 and 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Brother Bram says this is a description of Lucifer. Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, I want you to look at the condition that Lucifer is in. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never Never shalt thou be anymore. 
So Lucifer, we find out, Brother Bram tells us, he talks about it in many places. Lucifer was one of the covering cherubs, as we found out here in Ezekiel, and God had said him so. He was uh, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But, but although he was perfect, and I would also say it this way, uh, Lucifer was highly revelated. Lucifer knew the word of God. He, he was there in the, in the act of creation. He, he saw what was going on. He was a covering cherub. He was as close to God as you could get. And he was designed to be full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And God made him, I mean, he was called Lucifer. Lucifer means light bearer. He was a light bearer. So he was a carrier of the word. He was a light bearer. It means the shine or the morning star. He was the sun of the morning or sun of the dawn or the sun from the beginning. So he was, he, was, he was perfect. The Bible says he was perfect. The Bible said he was full of wisdom, not that he was lacking any. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But being full of wisdom and perfect in beauty and being as close to God as you could get, amen, he had it all good. Everything was good. But he had it so good that the perfection in him corrupted him. By all of his merchandise, there was iniquity found in him. There was violence in him. Amen. In, in his heart, verse 17, the heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness or thy splendor. So he was, I would say it this way, he was too good. His splendor and his brightness, it corrupted him. His wisdom, amen, it, it perverted him. He had it so good, he wasn't content with the full of wisdom and perfect and beauty that he had. He wanted to ascend above the stars of heaven. He wanted more. He didn't have enough. He wanted more. He wanted to be exalted. He wanted to be like the Most High. He was next to the Most High. Brother Bram said his right-hand man, equal to God, co-equal to God, and always except for creation. So you, you couldn't get much better than this, but, but in all that, Perfect world, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. I mean, the tabrets and the pipes and, and everything that he had, amen, all the perfection was able to turn to corruption within him. And so it's not necessarily being close to perfect will solve the problem. Sometimes the closer you get to perfect, it makes it worse. Having it easy, having it perfect, that's not, not necessarily going to solve the problem. So Lucifer, amen, was corrupted. And, and look at the destruction that will come from Lucifer in verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. Uh, Lucifer is going to be destroyed within himself. It looks to me like a self-destruction. And this is what happens to people. You, you see all the time, it's so good, everything's so good, everything's so perfect, amen, and they have a meltdown within themselves and they throw their whole life away. They destroy themselves from within themselves. And God is going to allow the same thing to happen to Lucifer. He's gonna, there's gonna be a fire within the midst of him that will destroy him. He has no character. I'd say it like this, if I could just put it in my words, he has everything but character. He had power, he had wisdom, he had beauty, he had authority, but he had no character. And the, and the message, the true vine and the false vine, Brother Ram says, now look at Cain. He came with sincerity, but look in the background, his daddy, the devil, he was influenced by his daddy. The reason in heaven, when he was up there, he set up a kingdom more beautiful, more elaborate, pretty than what Michael's was. He tried to get a greater kingdom. That's why he was kicked out. Pride, beauty, stuck up. And when he come here, there was a nature of him right in this boy, and it hasn't died yet. You believe that nature hasn't died yet? It's in humanity. 
always trying to do better, have pride. But, but I want to think about, when I look at this, I think about what was Michael's kingdom like if Lucifer could do one better? I wonder if even in the heavenly realms, if Michael, I'm just wondering if Michael's kingdom couldn't have still been humble even in the heavenly realms. It was humble in such a way that Lucifer was sure he could make one better. And sirs, we would see Jesus, Brother Bram says, God doesn't live in glamour, God lives in humility. Glamour comes from Satan. He lives in humility. When he was here on earth, he became the humblest among men, the poorest among men. Who, who was it wanted glamour? Satan. He wanted his kingdom greater than Michael's, so he set it up in the north, tried to outshine it, son of the morning. He says, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Notice Lucifer in the last days is doing as he did at first. What did Lucifer do? The first thing that Lucifer done to separate the fellowship of God and man, he wanted to build him a united kingdom, a greater splendor and seemingly more cultured, a greater kingdom than Michael Christ had. You got it? Now, now if you miss it, just hold up your hand. I'll say it again, you see. Lucifer at the beginning, his purpose and heart was to achieve a brighter and greater thing in heaven than Christ had. Is that right? By seemingly a more cultured, more beautiful, more splendor than the kingdom of Christ. That's amazing. That means that the kingdom of Christ, uh, this is, I'm just going to put it in my words. Just let me explain it the way I understand it. I may be wrong. But if that's possible, it looked like the splendor of Christ hadn't been maxed out on beauty and splendor. That somehow God had made the, 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 the kingdom of Michael, the kingdom of Christ, still in humility to where it wasn't maxed out to the top, where Lucifer was confident he could do one better. Because God is known in humility. God is not known in glamour. God is known in humility. So it's amazing how everything started in heaven the war broke out in heaven and moved down to earth and continues on today. And it's really the same thing that we're fighting with. Amen. It was Satan or Lucifer was really battling within himself. His perfection and his beauty and his wisdom was corrupting him from within. And he could not, because he had no character, could not look at the beauty of humility. Humility didn't look right to him. And he could do better than the humble kingdom of Christ. So he, he went about to do better, amen, and he, he wasn't satisfied with the portion that God gave him, for he said, I will build my kingdom on the side, my throne on the sides of the Lord. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will be like the Most High. And the battle goes right back to the same one we've always had, self-will versus the will of God. He wasn't satisfied with his portion, and his portion was beautiful. We can, we can fall into the same lot if we're not careful. God has given us so much, but let's not let the so much he's given us corrupt us, but let God, amen, in his own way of dealing with his children, bring enough tension and enough trials and enough pressure and enough heartache and enough disappointment, amen, to build in us the character, amen, to match the beauty of the word that he's given to us and the position he's put us in. God has a desire to exalt his bride, but he will not let his bride fall like Lucifer fell. So he will never exalt us, amen, above the character he's instilled in us to handle the position he puts us. So the word has painted a picture of where the bride belongs. Brother Benham has told us our position in Christ. We know that position is done. It's sealed before the foundation of the world. We were in him. We were in his mind. We were positionally placed in the mind of God. Amen. And that position is absolutely secure. But God's allowing us now in a body of flesh to be subject to things upon this earth that does not match our spiritual position. And if we try, amen, to, if we try to circumvent the natural circumstances we're in by claiming our spiritual position, amen, we're going to exalt ourselves above measure beyond the place that God has allowed us to attain to yet. You understand, God is building us up by faith. He's increasing us more and more and more. We're already there. We've already arrived. It's a finished work. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but God is working on some character right now. 
And we have to let him work on the character, amen, and not just claim my spiritual position and ignore all the things he's trying to do to build character and humility in my life, amen, so that as he lifts me degree by degree by degree, I can handle the position and the authority and the power of the word. So I say, praise be to God. Whatever comes, praise be to God. And you know, my initial reaction many times is to begin to grumble and complain, amen, and it it takes a little while sometimes to subdue the flesh and remember, this is a good thing. If it has crossed God's desk, if he has signed off on it, if he's authorized this trial, then this is a good thing for me. And if God has not authorized this trial, then, then something is happening outside of his will for my life, and now I'm not secure in my position in him. You realize it's either he authorized it or he didn't. If he didn't, then where does that put us? So if we're secure in our position in him, then he's authorized the trial. Let's turn to Jude. I want to look at, I just want to look at the approach and attitude and spirit of Michael. We see quite a bit in the scriptures about Lucifer And there's not a lot of scriptures about Michael, but I want to look at this one in Jude chapter 1, verse 8. Jude chapter 1, verse 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, the reason I read that is because we're looking at Michael who has character. We know Michael has character, amen? And Michael in his character, when he begins, when the devil begins to dispute with him over the body of Moses, he doesn't go off on him. He doesn't give him what for, amen. He doesn't even bring a railing accusation, amen. And who better knows the character and life of Lucifer? Who better knows the devil than Michael? They fought a war in heaven, amen. The war in heaven spelled out on earth, and now they're here disputing over the body of Moses, but he would not even bring a slanderous accusation against him, and he knew the character of the devil, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. I'm not dealing with you. I'm not accusing you. I'm not saying anything evil of you. The Lord rebuke you. The Lord deal with you. But somehow, we can feel justified in ourselves because we know the word and we know evil, we know the devil, and we speak, we can speak things about the devil that Michael wouldn't speak about the devil. Do you you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we get ideas that we call the devil names and we, we say we're stomping on the devil and... But we take an attitude. It's an attitude, friends. That doesn't mean that the devil's not going to be placed. Uh, Satan will not be placed under her feet. But who's placing him under her feet? Amen. It says, the God, blessed be the God of all peace that will bruise Satan shortly under your feet. Who's doing the bruising under your feet? It's God who's doing it. It's the power of God doing it. It's not, it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not angry, it's uh, words, it's not contentious, railing accusations coming out of the bride that'll put Satan under her feet. Amen, it doesn't matter what's coming out of your mouth. You can say all kinds of angry things and get all worked up and sweating, stomp all over the pulpit, but that's not changing anything. It's the God of peace, amen, who's bruising Satan under your feet. So, so if Michael disputing over the body of Moses, I mean, who was it that sent Michael down to get the body of Moses but God himself? He was there on an errand for God. He was there in obedience to the word. He was there in his post of duty. And the devil shows up and starts disputing with him over this body. Amen. And he doesn't even bring a railing accusation. He just says, the Lord rebuke you. You know, what makes us think if we take that same spirit that somehow, if we start calling the devil names and say stuff like, the devil's stupid. Come on, how childish is that? 
How child, do you really think when Lucifer is full of wisdom that the devil's stupid? We only say that to make ourselves feel better. To make ourselves feel powerful in our own human expression, in our own human mind. But the reality is, the Lord deal with you. I'm not going to say anything because maybe God is letting you do this right now. Maybe the Lord is letting you afflict me. I'm not going to bring a railing accusation. I'm not going to call you names. I'm not going to spit fire at you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm just going to say, the Lord deal with you. I'm in the hands of my God. And don't worry, the Lord will deal with you. We don't have to worry about it. So, so, you know, it has a lot to do with attitude. And it's easy to take the human nature and not the nature of Christ. But we have to subdue that human nature, and that's a wrestling match that we all have every day of our lives is to subdue the flesh, amen? Subdue that natural, that, that natural spirit, amen? To let the Holy Spirit have free reign, that the life of Christ come out. So we see the nature of Michael here. Brother Bram says in a message conference with God, now my Catholic brother and also many of my Protest- Protestants, I'm not hurting you, but when you try to make Jesus a little lesser God than God, uh, make him a lesser God, you cut his feet off, bring him down just a little bit under the head of God and make him a lesser God. You're so wrong. Jesus was man. He called himself the son of man. That was a death blow to the devil. The devil's high, built himself a kingdom more beautiful than Michael's. Cain, his son, wanted to make a pretty altar, all out of fruits and things. God doesn't dwell in that kind of beauty, but God, to strike the death blow to sin, look how he come. How did he choose to come? There's a conference in heaven. How are you going down? How are you going to do it, Father, said the angels. There's a conference in heaven and they're asking, How are you going to go down? How are you going to do it, Father? I'm going to become one of them. My law of redemption is a near kinsman, and I'll have to be a man myself. That's the strike that knocks Satan. He couldn't come down with, he could have come down with cherubims. He could have come down the golden ladders. There could have been anthems sung through the heavens, and he could have walked to the earth and expelled everything. But when he held the conference, he decided to come as a babe. In Isaiah 9 and 6, we find it, unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called the Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And of his dominion there shall be no end. This will be a sign unto you, a babe, not a God, a baby. Look where he was born. It had to be decided in the conference where he'd be born to make sure he was man. He was born in a stable. He chose instead of the ivory palace guard to bring him, instead of an angel escort, instead of rolling cherubims with the fineries of heaven, he stuck himself, put himself in a stable over the manure of animals, the dirt and filth of the world. That's how God chose to come when he come in flesh. And, And what gives us the idea that everything has to be nice for us? Where do we get the idea that God is obligated to make everything nice for us? To the point that we start to get offended at God when trials start to come, when we have, and when we have losses, when we have rejection, when we, we have all these things that happen in our life for our good, we begin to become offended at God and question the integrity of God. What right do we have, amen, to, to have everything perfect? I think God wants character. If he himself came in humility, how does he want his bride? In arrogance and pride or in humility? Let's look at Isaiah 42. Let's look at these prophecies of Christ coming. Isaiah 42. We'll start with verse 1. Isaiah 42 and 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Look at this nature 
that's coming forth. He's sending his elect, he's sending his servant to come down. But he shall not cry nor lift his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Look how gentle and how timid and how mild natured Christ came. Not what man wanted in a king. Not what man was looking for in a great deliverer, but he comes so meek and so mild and so humble and so tender, amen, that, that, that the world missed what was in their midst because of the humility, because Satan, Lucifer, cannot see God in humility. They can only see splendor. Praise be to God. But the bride can see him in humility. Let's turn over to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, and shall, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is how Christ came. This is how Christ was treated. This, is, this was the plan of God for his only begotten son. And if that's how the bridegroom come to earth in humility and how the bridegroom was treated and God's plan for the bridegroom, I wonder what is God's plan for the bride? Amen. What is God's plan for the bride? And we should we be disappointed in diverse temptations and manifold temptations, or should we begin to rejoice now? Amen. Because, because if this is the way the bridegroom was on earth, and this is the way he was treated, and he was afflicted, and, and, he, and he was rejected, and, and, and he was unknown, and he had no beauty that we should desire him, what about his humble little bride, amen? Because he's got to have a bride that matches his character. He's got to have a bride that's a compliment to him. Amen. And, and his bride, you know, we know the bride is beautiful. The bride is, is, is tremendous because it's God's chosen. But her beauty may not be in what we consider beauty, but it might be the beauty of humility that matches the humility of Christ. And Brother Bram wasn't just joking when he said the way up is down. It was a concept, it was a reality, it was a truth that, uh, that I myself want to be more comfortable with, that the way up is down, amen? Amen, he that is abased in due time shall be exalted, amen, just, just lower. And Brother Ben said, if you want to see how high you can go, see how little you can become. Just be nothing, amen? Be absolutely nothing and let God make what he wants out of us. So in this life, amen, in this life, the goal is not to be special. The goal is to be nothing. 
Because God's going to do something special with nothing. God's going to do something wonderful with nothing. He's going to take nobody and do what only he can do. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I wonder sometimes if the Word made flesh has always been crucified. That's right. The Word made flesh has always been rejected. It's always been cast away. It's always come in humility. It's always been low to the standard of the world. It's always been ignorant to the wisdom of the world. Like in, in Noah's day, they had scientific proof that Noah's message was wrong. Noah looked ignorant, he looked foolish, he looked childish in believing what he believed because they had scientific data, they had instruments, Brother Branham said, that could shoot the moon and see that there was no water up there. And so the word made flesh and every day was rejected, kicked around, uh, belittled. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, uh, treated badly every time. So if we are the word made flesh, what is our expectation in this day? Are we expecting a smooth ride and an acceptance from all, a, a, a lifted up and put on a pedestal and nothing bad ever happening? I think if we have that expectation, we have the wrong expectation. Christ learned obedience by the things he suffered. Christ is in you. How are you learning obedience the same way? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse five. Of such a one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure." Verse seven is the love of God expressed. Verse seven is the grace of God to the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul was given an abundance of revelation, for lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, what did Lucifer had? Abundance of revelation. But what did Paul get in God's love that Lucifer didn't get? Paul got a thorn in the flesh, an affliction that would abase him and keep him needy and dependent on God and keep him humbled. That's one thing God did not give to Lucifer. So what would be greater, to be in Lucifer's position as an archangel, perfect in beauty, amen, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, with the taverns and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and the pipes and everything so perfect and so wonderful, or would it be better to be Paul, afflicted and smitten, amen, with a thorn in the flesh, humble and dependent and needy? I would say God's love expressed would be expressed in Paul, amen, to not let Paul get exalted above measure because, it, because with the abundance of revelation comes danger. If I could say it that way, the abundance of revelation brings with it danger. Oh, praise be to God. So God's love for us will send a, a thorn in the flesh, an affliction, a messenger of Satan to buffet us to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Verse 7 is God's grace and love to Paul. Verse 10 is 
Paul's correct understanding and thankfulness expressed back to God. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It's the opposite of what we think, friends. God, God, I would say it this way, the pressure's increasing for the bride. Do you feel it? And that's a good thing. Because the place that he wants to take her and the revelation he wants to give to her and the understanding that she will operate by is a very dangerous level of revelation. It can be a very deadly, very dangerous level of revelation, amen, and the position and the power that comes with that revelation that he wants to give to the bride and unlock under her is very deadly. And the only way that God can unlock more is when he brings the affliction and the reproach and the necessities necessary to mold the character so that the, 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 the character rises to a level that God can unlock more. So we keep praying for more revelation. Who has prayed for more revelation in the last couple of years? Well, welcome to the show. Right? We pray for more revelation, but, but God cannot. I mean, God, God has predestinated his bride not to fall. He must ensure that she will not fall. God had predestinated the apostle Paul to the work that the apostle Paul was going to do. There was no one else that could do that job. So God had to get the apostle Paul into a place where God could give him an abundance of revelation, but that that abundance of revelation would not corrupt Paul. And the only way that he could give him such revelation on the the word was to bring such affliction and need and reproach that Paul would not get lifted up no matter how much revelation God poured on because Paul could not exalt himself because he was so abased. God's love to Paul and his affliction was better, was a better love than he had to Lucifer in his perfection. Amen. I say, God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord. It, it, it's put, a, put me in, it's put me in a strait. It's put me in contention. It's put me in distress, and I thank you for it, Lord. I needed it. Let's go to Isaiah chapter six. How many believes God's going to unlock more of his word for us? <laughs> you just said it. You just did it. And if he's going to, then he's going to have to unlock more troubles, trials, pressures. Because it's only in humility and of a contrite spirit and humility and brokenness that God can give such authority and power. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am a man undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah's revelation, amen, did not exalt Isaiah. Isaiah's revelation abased Isaiah because when Isaiah saw the holiness of God and the holy worship of the seraphims, he realized that he was nothing and that he was unclean, a man of unclean lips, and he was abased by the revelation. And here's what Brother Bram says in the message Influence from 63. Let's think, he with two wings he had over his face. In the presence of God, humility or reverence, and secondly, he had two wings over his feet. What was it? In humility. And third, he flew with them, but put, but put himself in action. 
He put himself in action with two wings while two more wings covered his face in reverence. Two wings covered his feet in humility. Two wings he was in action. What was he doing? He was showing the prophet. By this, he was showing the prophet how his prepared servants must be. God, God prepared service must be reverent, humble, and in action. Later, he preaches influence again at the end of the year. He says, now in closing, I might, I might use these other two wings. Thirdly, he could fly with these other two wings. Watch, face covered by the holiness of God and in reverence, his feet covered in humility, and with two wings, he could put himself in action to move. God was showing his prophet how a prepared servant ought to be. Quit looking at Uzziah. Here is your example I've set before you. Cover your face in reverence, cover your feet in humility, and go into action. Oh, what an example. He had looked at Uzziah so long and seen it fail. Now God is telling him what to do. Show him a prepared servant. He went into action. So God, through the vision, was showing Isaiah. Isaiah had watched Uzziah, but Uzziah could not keep himself in humility. Isaiah was lifted up because he was king, and, and when he was lifted up as king, he thought he could transgress the word of God. He thought that God had blessed him so much that he had risen to such a level, his kingdom was such, his blessing was such, he was chosen of God, placed of God, amen? He was defended by God, amen? He was blessed by God so much that he thought he could transgress the word and he could go in and offer incense, which only the priest could do. And God is no respecter of person. No matter how much Uzziah was chosen, no matter how much he was placed, no matter how much he was blessed, as soon as he transgressed the word of God, he was smitten with leprosy. And Isaiah had watched the blessings of Uzziah, the king, the, the anointed of God, the place of God, and he had watched these blessings, and he was, he was really just following along with Uzziah, but he saw Uzziah fail in humility and in reverence. So God opens up a window in heaven and shows him, amen, in heaven he shows the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and he sees the seraphims, amen, the holy seraphims, Brother Benham said, that had never sinned before. God is so holy that the sinless creatures in heaven that worship him have to cover their face in, in reverence and their feet in humility. And he said he showed them in reverence and in humility and in action. See, the action doesn't work unless there's reverence and humility. A prepared servant of God must be reverent, humble, and in action. And sometimes we think all the works that we do Amen, are the thing that matter, but the action was the third part. The reverence and humility was the first. We've got to get reverence and humility first and then get into action. That's God's plan. But human beings, just like Lucifer, have such a trouble. Cain had such trouble. It's amazing that God... When, when God was going to bring his word, he was going to bring a deliverance. He was going to bring his children out of Egypt. Amen. He already had a chosen vessel named Moses, and Moses was the chosen vessel of God. And Moses was raised with all the education, with all the understanding, with all the wealth and blessing of Egypt as a son to Pharaoh. But God allowed that for a reason. Amen. And, and with all that wisdom and with all that power, amen, he could do nothing for the kingdom of God. He tried, he put forth an effort, he was rejected. He ran away defeated into the wilderness and he, and he left Egypt defeated. He left, he left Egypt rejected and dejected. And for 40 years, God worked to strip all of that out of him. I think God let it get put in him so God could strip it out of him so Moses could realize that's not gonna work. 40 years of, of the best education, the, the, the best food, the best military training, the best of everything, science and, and literature, the best of everything produced nothing for God. Although he was the right man in the right season, amen? 
but he was using worldly wisdom and it didn't work. So God let him go as rejected into the wilderness until Moses got to the place where he, he, he believed himself to be so incapable that when God come down in a burning bush through a supernatural encounter and spoke to him directly and said, go, he was so convinced he couldn't do it that he, that he began to argue with God. And he begins to say, send somebody else. Oh, God, I, no, not me. Send somebody else. I can't do it. I can't speak. They won't listen to me. He had, he had so many excuses because God had finally got him to where he wanted him to be. He was abased. He knew he was worthless. He knew he was incapable. So what was the rejection in the wilderness journey about? It was the getting to that place right there. God wasn't not building up his self-esteem. <laughs> In the wilderness, he wasn't building up his prestige and his wisdom. And he wasn't building any of that. He was breaking him down to humility, amen, to where he became a simple herder. And God took him when he was low and incapable and unable. And he marched him right back into the same place he was before. And he left in his strength. He left and he left capable and able to do something. He came back completely incapable and unable to do anything. And when he got to that place, God put into, into his servant's hands the spoken word of God, the power to create where there was nothing before. And then by Moses, through Moses, and in Moses, God did, did acts upon the earth, amen, that the earth had not seen. And he delivered them with a mighty hand using Moses, using Moses' mouth, using Moses' body. But not when Moses was strong, but when Moses was weak. And God would take that man and pour such an abundance of revelation into him that he would write the Old Testament, he would write the law, he would write the word that would set the stage for 4,000 years of Judaism. And then when it was time to write the New Testament, he did the exact same thing. He took the Apostle Paul, who was raised up a Jew, raised up a Pharisee among Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, raised up in the school of Gamaliel. He had everything going for him as a Jew. He had, I mean, he had prestige amongst the priests. He had camaraderie amongst the priests. He, he, he was given letters from the high priest. He had everything he needed to be everything that, that he wanted to be for the kingdom of God. And God allowed it to go in, just like Moses. The Old Testament and New Testament pattern one another. One's a shadow of the other. And here comes the Apostle Paul. He's moving down, zealous to do something in his strength and in his power with his connections and his intellect, do something for God. And God strikes him down. He meets the pillar of fire. He's blinded and he's abased. And now he goes blind, led by the hand into the city, into a house, waiting for somebody, that, the very person he came to arrest. The very ones he came to persecute and arrest and throw into prison. Now he's got to be so humble. The very one he on his high horse came to arrest and throw in jail is the very one God's going to send to lay hands on him so he can receive his sight. And speak to him commandments of the word of the Lord. And then he was going to go out to, into the desert in Arabia. And in the desert, God was not building him up. God was stripping him down. And then when Paul finally believed he knew nothing, he gave up all his ability, his prestige, his connections. God used him to write the New Testament. See, God doesn't work the way man works. God will take what's exalted and he'll bring it low so he can use it because he can't use it up here. He can only use it down here. He brought Moses down here. He brought the apostle Paul down here. And when it was broken and it was humbled and it was humiliated, he was ready to use it. When God, in the Old Testament, he, he, 
work through Moses that way, but when it came time to announce, when there was time for a forerunner to come to announce that Christ was coming upon the earth, amen, he did it different this time. He took somebody, amen, the John the Baptist and sent him to the wilderness when he was a boy and did not let him get an education, did not let him get indoctrinated, did not let him learn culture or civilization or nothing. He was raised in the wilderness because God needed a clean slate because he had such a job to do. He had to come not knowing anything. Ignorant, amen? Unlearned, incapable, amen? No, no religious training, no nothing. And God could take that humble creature that was, was clothed in camel's hair, eating locust and honey. And in humility, he would become the forerunner and announcer of the coming of Christ to earth. So if that's the Old Testament pattern, what do you think the New Testament pattern is? When it came time for, for another forerunner, amen, God would take a... a, a I would, would take a man out of the hills of Kentucky, amen, one of the most laughed at places in the United States. One of the most backwards, dejected and rejected places in the United States, amen. The, the, there's a lot of jokes told about that area. He wouldn't let him get a formal education, but his education was cut short. No religious training whatsoever. You see the pattern, Old Testament, New Testament? Because what was he doing? He was announcing his coming. And God would take utter humility, no seminary training, no connections in the religious world, no formal education, no intellect, no prestige, no power, no might, no strength, no nothing, but ignorant and backward, uncivilized. Amen. When, when finally the angel of the Lord spoke to him and told him to take a gift of healing to the peoples of the world, amen, the prophet of God didn't even have a proper suit. He pieced together a coat and a pair of pants, and his coat had a rip. Amen. The pocket was ripped off. He stitched it together himself, and he was so ashamed of it, he would hold his right hand over it to hide it. Amen. And he would stick out his left hand. And he would say, pardon the left hand, it's closer to my heart. <laughs> Shaking his left hand, it's closer to my heart. And he didn't want people to see his humility and his shame and his raggedness. And what was happening? While he was walking in that ragged coat, God was opening blinded eyes. He was healing the sick. Lepers were being delivered. Amen. He was doing miracle upon miracle, eight days straight. Amen. I mean, where there's thousands and thousands and thousands of healings. Amen. And God uses something so humble, so ignorant, so broken, so unconnected to do the most marvelous things that we have in, in recorded history. I don't think we're ready yet. I think God is making us ready. I think God is going to continue to strip all self away. Self-will, self-desire, self-respect. Self-dependency, self-esteem. I think God's gonna continue. And I just say it for me, I wanna go willingly. I wanna make this process as easy as possible. I wanna humble myself, I want to abase myself. I don't want God to have to turn up the temperature, amen, to get me where I need to be because I believe I'm one of them. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm one of them. I believe God's gonna do a work and I'm here for that work. I believe it, but God's got to get the character to match the work. And I want to say right now, Lord, I lay my life down. I surrender all. I do not want to have self-esteem, self-will, self-pride. I don't want to have self-sufficiency. I don't want anything of self. I am nothing. I know I'm nothing. I'm incapable. I'm unable. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing that you can use. I don't have wisdom. I don't have a strength. I don't have money. I, don't, I have nothing that you want. Nothing that I can do to help you along. All I have is this vessel and I give it to you. God is, God is going to use these circumstances to get us where we need to be, but let's just be willing. 
willing to fall upon the stone and be broken again. And fall upon the stone and be broken again. And fall upon the stone and be broken again. Look at what God uses. You have Lucifer and Michael. Look at the attitude of Lucifer. Look at the attitude of Michael. You have Cain and Abel. Look at the attitude of Cain and look at, look at Abel. Abel was replaced with Seth. Seth line became herdsmen. Brother Bram said simple, simple herd, herdsmen. Cain's lines became manufacturers, amen, makers of music and cities and manufacturing and metals and science and learning. Look at the difference between Pharaoh and Moses when Moses came marching back into Egypt. Look at the difference between Jesus and Caiaphas. You see, which side do you want to be on? I say, I'll take the lowly side. I'll take the humble side, the abased side, the side that has nothing, can do nothing, can offer nothing. That's the side that I want to be on. Like Seth and the herdsmen, not Cain and the brilliant ones who figured everything out. So wise that they could build a tower unto heaven. I would rather be like Seth line, the little herdsman who's just content herding the flock and taking care of my family. Just content with the portion God gave me. Michael was content with the portion God gave him. Lucifer was not content with his portion. No matter how great and magnificent a portion it was, it was the greatest portion in heaven outside of Michael's and he wasn't content with it. I said, God help me. Let's turn to Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three and verse four. I'll say it this way. If we can't say it today with an honest heart, I'm nothing, I know nothing, I can do nothing in my flesh. I have nothing that I can offer him that'll do him any good, that'll improve him any. If we can't say that now, I believe by the time this is over, we will be able to say that. Philippians chapter three, verse four. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus." Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if, any, and if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Even in, even in the area you've already attained, have the same mind that you're pressing on that you're growing more, that you're pressing towards the mark of the high calling in Christ, that you've not already arrived. I've arrived in the plan of God. I've arrived in the perfection of God, but God in this life has me still on the journey of perfection, getting my character to where he wants it to be to do what he wants to do in this life. And I say, God, let me be like Paul. 
Let me count everything but loss that I might win you. That I might just win you. We'll look at two more scriptures as we close. Let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18 and 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now we've got God's idea on it. This is what Christ thought. The disciples were, in many places in the scriptures, they're arguing amongst themselves who will be greatest and who will have this position, and who will sit on the right hand and who will sit on the left when he comes into his kingdom. And they had no idea what sacrifice it was gonna take for him to come into that kingdom. They, they had no idea what they were even really talking about. They had felt good because they were with him. They were in the campaigns. They saw the miracles. They, they had passed out the bread that was broken. They, they, had, they had been part of the two by two that were sent out and they had saw miracles and demons cast out and they were just enthused and excited about being part of this ministry, amen. And so they began the, the, the question, who's the greatest and how do we know? And, and you know, why do you ask the question, who's the greatest? Unless you think one of them might be, you know, like you're a contender. Do you understand? When you know you're nothing, you don't even care. I mean, everybody else is greater than me, so who, why even ask the question? True humility doesn't, is not concerned with who's on top. Who's the greatest one? Who's the most revelated? Who has the best understanding? I mean, who, who has the best life? When you're the lowest, you're not even in contention, so it's not even a question in your mind. You know, you know that you're in the bottom half of the bottom half. So who's the greatest? Well, it's going to be one of them out there. But see, the, the whole debate was because they thought that possibly they were a contender for top place. And so Jesus, in his wisdom, I mean, he gives them a lesson they'll never forget. He brings a little child along, and he puts a little child in their midst. He said, unless you humble yourself, and become like one of these little children. You shall not even see the kingdom. Don't even worry about who's greatest. If you can't humble yourself and be like this child, you won't even see it. Whosoever can humble themselves and be like a child, they shall be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Where do you think Brother Branham gets the statement, the way up is down? right out of the scriptures. The way up is down. To become like a little child, innocent, submissive, trusting, believing. Just taking the word at face value, just taking what he said and believing it and standing on it and not reasoning it and not figuring it out. Amen, the little child doesn't figure out. Amen, if daddy tells him something, he believes daddy's gonna do it and he doesn't have to reason it out. And he doesn't have to figure out how it's gonna happen. If daddy said it, daddy means it, it's gonna happen. We need to be like little children. Amen. Without malice, without contention, without uh, our own wisdom injected. See, there's two sides to us, friends. There's the God side and the human side. And I think sometimes we try to make the human side equal to the God side. And we say things uh, sometimes we say things in a way to where I think that it's possible that we can corrupt ourselves with our own wisdom and our own revelation. Like we understand where we came from and where we're going. We understand the plan of God from before the foundation of the world all the way through to the end. 
We've been given illumination and we've got a, a certain brightness, a certain splendor in revelation. But Paul was able to say, I've not yet attained. I've not yet apprehended that which God I'm apprehended by. I don't think Paul was talking about the spiritual side. He's talking about the flesh side. And see, we can say things in such a way that we can be corrupted by our own splendor and our own brightness and not realize that there's areas in our lives that don't match the word. And somehow, because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, it's okay. Like there's areas of compromise and areas uh, uh, of ungodliness and there's areas that, that don't match the scripture, and, and, but because we are so revelated and have such an understanding, amen, and we believe we're children of God, where we came from, where we're going, that somehow that these things can go unchecked in our life and it's okay. I say, let's not be corrupted by our own brightness. If anything, let the brightness shine down inside. And say, Lord, let the brightness of your word expose all my bads. Don't let me use the brightness of your word to cover my bads, but let the brightness of your word expose, expose the pride, expose the arrogancy, amen, expose the, the lies that I tell myself, but expose the hypocrisy. Sometimes we want the light to shine out, but I want the light to shine in. Light, the bright light of revelation to shine in because I don't believe revelation came to cover my error in a way that I don't have to deal with it and just ignore it. But I believe the revelation came to lift me up into a higher plane, to live the very life that Jesus Christ lived. And I believe that's the purpose of revelation, to bring us into a place where it's not us, it's him. It's not my dues, it's not, it's not my efforts, it's him, I surrendered all, but I'm not going to keep pretending that I'm pretending that, but let the light shine until I can come to reality with where I am. Lord, I need you in this area of my life. Lord, I need help in this. Lord, I need you to root this out of me. This is not pleasing to you. God, I need you. I'm not gonna use my splendor to allow corruption to grow and I keep hidden something that I need to be exposing. Lucifer was corrupted by his brightness, by his wisdom, by his perfection. I said, God, let me not be corrupted, amen, but let me be ground down to nothing and rebuilt by your revelation. Let me humble myself as a child and be honest. I've seen so many things that trouble me in myself and outside myself, so many times justifications for actions are given with a religious tone, with a quote misused to justify my own willful desire. We've seen it, we've all seen it, we've all experienced it, we've probably all tried to do it if we just be honest with ourselves. Find a justification. You know, I, I, I really have a desire for this and I have a desire to do that. And if I could just find a quote. When we know in ourselves it's not what God wants. But let the word, Lord, expose me and root out all selfishness and all of self. I want to abase myself. I want to become like that little child and be honest, Lord and be truthful. Praise God. I think sometimes, I think what I've seen sometimes is sometimes people become more dogmatic in the message to cover their own rottenness on the inside. More dogmatic and make everybody else around them feel like an unbeliever point out flaws and point out this off the word and point out this. 
Sometimes I want to say, brother, quit pointing out everybody else's faults. Let's talk about yours for a while. You've got such brightness that you can see flaws anywhere. You've got a gift. Now let's use that gift on you for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden the whole attitude changes. I don't want that to be me. If I ever do a fault finding trip, I want to do it right in my own heart. And whatever I find, I want to lay it before the Lord and say, God, I need some help with this. This doesn't match your word. This isn't pleasing to you. This is not what you want. What kind of bride is he looking for? One that's just like the bridegroom. Brother Branham said, he talked about, he went to that Pentecostal meeting and the, the pastor was talking to him and all of a sudden the pastor introduced his wife. And she said she had bobbed hair all painted up and jewelry on and all this stuff. And he said, I, I can't remember the exact words that he used, but he said, I thought you said your wife was a saint. He said, she looks more like a haint. <laughs> and Brother Branham could judge that man by his wife. Because Brother Ram tells us in Choosing a Bride, the, the kind of woman that a man will choose reflects what kind of character is on the inside. So what kind of bride is Christ choosing? He's choosing a bride that reflects the character that's on the inside of him. Christ could come in utter humility. He could come as a baby in a manger born over a manure pile. God, when he come in flesh that way, he could come in such simplicity and such humility, and Jesus could be ill-spoken of and not speak evil back. He could be smitten and not smite back. Amen. He could subdue himself. He could subdue his own nature. Amen. He could humble himself. And if he can do that, his bride can do it too. If he can live in humility, if he could surrender his will, amen, to the plan of God, then his bride can do it the same way. If he can go through Gethsemane, then his bride can go through Gethsemane as well. If he could stand there and be crucified for, to fulfill the word of God and the will of God, his bride can stand and be crucified too. I said, God, that's the life I want to live. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. I want to finish with this scripture. First Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 25, or chapter 1 and verse 25. Musicians, you can go ahead and make your way up. Brother Ben, if you could come. 1 Corinthians 1 and 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Lord. Let's all stand. The scripture says, He's chosen the foolish things of the world. Who wants to be foolish now? He's chosen the weak things of the world. Who wants to be weak now? You see, if God wants to take the weak, the foolish, the rejected, the downcast, the nobodies, to, so that no flesh can glory in his presence, so that he can do a work through nothing, then my goal is to be nothing. My goal is to be foolish in the eyes of the world, to be weak in the eyes of the world, to be nothing, because if I can become that, then that's the very thing that he's looking for to show himself mighty and to do his work through. So if we believe, Romans 16, that the God of all peace shall bruise Satan shortly under your feet, 
What kind of vessel is he looking for to bruise Satan under your feet? He's looking for weakness, humility, foolishness. He's not looking for somebody who's got it all figured out and knows the answer to everything. He's looking for somebody who doesn't know what's coming next and how to handle it. He's looking for somebody who, who doesn't know what the chaos in the world is gonna to equal to and what we're gonna do next and how we're gonna make the next decision and what even the right thing to do is next. That's what he's looking for. And so I, I myself am tired of trying to have the pressure of having it all figured out. I decided I'm gonna become foolish. Hallelujah. Next time you ask me, Brother Chad, what do you think is gonna happen next? I'm gonna tell you, I have absolutely no idea. Do you think this could go this way and this could go that way? Sure, but it may not. And I don't know, I have no idea. All I know is he's got it figured out. I just gotta keep my hand in his, be little, he's big, be nothing, he's everything, be foolish, he's all wisdom. I don't have to figure it out, I don't have to give an answer, I don't have to pretend to know. All I have to know is him, and I have to have the character to match his character, and if I do, he'll pluck me up and do great things through nothing. Like he did with Moses, like he did with Paul, like he did with Brother Branham, like he did with John the Baptist, like he did with Amos, like he did with all of them. Look who God was looking for. Say, Lord, I... I want to take all my message merit badges and throw them in the trash. And all my 40 years and have it figured out and know the word, and I just want to throw it all away and say, God, I know nothing but you. And anything you've revealed to me is by your grace, not by my effort. What you've given me, you've given me by your grace. And Lord, if I can stay low, you can keep lifting me higher. I can stay low, you can keep lifting me higher. The way up is down. Humility is his character. Jesus Christ came in utter, complete humility. His bride is able to humble herself. And if she's not convinced of that yet, he'll make sure, he'll make sure that by the time we're out of here, that the same character that Jesus Christ had will be displayed in his bride. And I just want to lay my life down. And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for every trial, every obstacle, for all the tension, Lord. God, in the last short while, the last several months, Lord, you've begun to unravel our wisdom, our resolve, our strength. You begin to expose, Lord, our selfishness and our pride. God, I'm thankful for that. Lord, I pray you'd forgive us, Lord, that we could humble ourselves before you and admit our wrong. Say we were too proud, Lord. We were too self-sufficient, too confident in our own selves. But God, we want to become like that little child that you used for an example. We just want to be happy, Lord, trusting, joyful, confident that you're in charge and everything's okay. Lord, we don't want to be the great, the mighty. We just want to be the humble. We just want to be the nothings of the world that you can pick up and do something with. We want to be the humbled and the abased that really show your mighty power and your glory. Not the strength of our flesh, but the strength of your word. Not the abilities of, of our flesh, our humanness, but your ability, Lord, to bring us through. God, I pray that every trial would have its perfect work in us. Every bit of pressure, Lord, would accomplish its purpose, that our pride would diminish, that our self-sufficiency would go away, that our self-esteem would be crushed, and that through humility and brokenness, Lord, we can be vessels that you can use for your glory. God, I love you. I thank you for your beautiful plan and your word. I thank you, God, 
for the mighty things that you're going to do. I thank you, Lord, for the tremendous things that will be accomplished on this earth by your hand. And God, I just want to be a part of it, Lord. I want to be the tool in your hand, the vessel that you use. I want you, Lord, the God of all peace, to bruise Satan under my feet shortly. Lord, all you need is some feet, you can have mine. You need a body, you can have mine. I surrender it to you, Lord. In humility and reverence, I give it to you, Lord. And I pray, God, that we can, as your servants, have the right approach in reverence and in humility and in action, Lord. That we would get the reverence and humility right first. And then by your grace, you would put us into action for your kingdom's work. That we could accomplish your will upon this earth, Lord. Let our wills diminish and let your will increase. Lord, I love you with all of my heart. Take your people, Lord. Mold us into what you want us to be, Lord. Make us into what you desire for us. And use us, Lord, for the purpose you foreordained before the foundation of the world. We're here by your plan. We're here for your purpose. We're here, Lord, because you called us, you placed us, you foreordained us. We're here, Lord. Now mold us into the character that you can use for your glory. And God, do a mighty work like this world has never seen. Lord, because you have humble, broken vessels that you can depend on, that you can use. May all the glory be yours, Lord, and not any human beings. May all the praise go to you and not any flesh, that you might be glorified and magnified through us. We surrender all to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brother Ben, can you sing?
start it over again. And I bless the day he didn't throw the clay away over and over. He molds me and makes me Yeah.
who 